Hello friends, and welcome to my new video, in which I'll tell you some amazing stories. But before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. Also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories in the comments. Let's get started. The first story is Beer Rescuers. I'll start by explaining my hubby and myself to you. Having served in combat and sustained injuries, my spouse was able to use his sharp vision and high level of alertness to protect assets for a big box retailer after returning home. In general, nothing phases him. He was never permitted to use physical force to stop someone, even if it was to protect himself or others. Besides being huge, muscular, and menacing, it was rarely a problem. As a result, he had an incredible ability to read people and comprehend the growth and boldness that result from thieves continuing to get away with their crimes. Before his incredibly traumatic deployment, our youngest child's custody struggle and VA battles, I used to be pretty cowardly in confrontational situations and just wanted everyone to get along. These days, not much freaks me off. Being a shopping wife allowed them to act boldly in front of us without realizing they were being monitored in real time, so there were times I helped him with his work. In addition, throughout the ten years we were there, our neighborhood took a turn for the worst, which prevented many break-ins at the residences of our neighbors, comparable to a DC squat. Since my spouse and I were both youth ministers, we get along well with a lot of the young adults in our community. The Narrative That day, my husband and I performed a number of errands, including necessary purchasing for farm repairs. Being on the farm also means that we are far from the city, therefore we make an effort to complete as much as we can in one sitting. We were both somewhat exhausted because he had worked earlier in the day. Let's name it Stacy's on River Road. It's the last gas station before we head home. We used to live close by, are acquainted with several of the staff members, and know people who were hurt in armed robberies, so we have a history with this specific store. Frequently, when the crew was powerless to stop them, Hubby stopped them and recovered the stolen goods. He was more than willing to help where the staff was unable to after years of being limited in what they could accomplish. The problem with thieves is that they are easy prey particularly for isolated 24-hour businesses that are hidden from police sight on the outskirts of town. Addicts and young children alike will quickly grab and flee. This kind of behavior needs to be stopped and dealt with right away, or else it will get worse and eventually involve weapons. When he witnesses it, we've been there for each other, cooperating to retrieve the objects and defuse the situation. Only once have we needed to call the police. He offers to get my electrolyte drink so I may stay outside in the cool air as we are both tired and in the mood for some beverages this evening. After we arrive home, I'm going through everything I need to do because feeding all the sanctuary animals after dark is a little bit more difficult. It could be simpler if I move them all to one side and feed them all at once. I hate it, but since it's almost time for bed, will they follow me? I might just wash everything but my hair in the morning since I know I need to take a shower tonight and I can't sleep with my wet hair. Sending a brief text. Hey, I'll share my ice cream with you if you'll go ahead and do the pigs feeding for me. I feel bad it's so late. To our adolescent child at home. Keep an eye out till the scent green check mark appears. Look up to see why it's taking your husband so long. It's our former youth member, that's what. He chopped off his curly hair. It's obvious that I'm not focused on the specifics or activities around us. Then, a very scruffy, small-framed man carrying some cheap beer walks out of the store looking irate. Okay, I see. The other young man who was employed then emerges to attempt to halt him. This does not appear promising. It's clear that there was a confrontation because he threatened the child. Now my spouse, who is 6'2 with a thick, muscular build, notices what we term a youngster, feels frightened by the man, and runs out too. Things are starting to change now. I want to go home, man. I'm weary. But you have to try stealing right now? I want to go home, man. I'm weary, but you have to try stealing right now? 
and my husband tries to talk him down by giving him a chance to just turn in his pilfered item. As for the knights, well, unbuckle ahead of time, just in case. Now that he's protected, the child is accompanying his husband to retrieve the product, since he's very certain that he will get the beer back. I could no longer hear them yelling after a few minutes. Oh no. I'm so exhausted. Maybe I should just go pick them up. Then I question whether or not he had the time for pay for our purchases. Not now. Pay attention. Husband is pursuing the thief of beer. We must get him first in order to immediately return home. I let out a sigh, recognizing that in order to drive and go pick him up, I need to force my brain to function. Open the passenger door after letting out the irritated growl. It's a horrible drop for me because the Jeep has a lift kit, so it slides out and down. Make sure your spouse purchases running boards so I don't appear like a little child stepping out of the car. People stare at me after I close the passenger door and start to move around. I start telling myself just how foolish this is and that all I really want to do is go home. But no, people have to steal everything. I'm really irritated. Really. I then go into the driver's seat, raise the seat so that my short legs can reach the gas pedal and turn on the Jeep. I was so done that I'm not even sure if I fastened my seatbelt. When I reverse out, I worry what scene I'll find myself in and if the guy is in a chokehold. To what extent did they run? Where did your spouse get the strength to run? I spot some silhouettes beneath the street light half a block away as I approach the exit at the rear of the building where I last saw them. When I pull up, I notice the child 50 feet ahead of my spouse. When I arrive to get the scoop, my spouse simply gestures and says, He's there. I simply click OK in my fatigued brain and begin driving toward the thief they haven't yet apprehended. Why? I suppose instinct. I'm not even sure I fully understand it. The thief is approaching an ally, so I'll simply move the jeep to the side in order to stop him. Once more, my mind is racing because I didn't have a strategy for this situation, so I'm not sure what I expected to happen next. If I manage to get him severed, perhaps my spouse will be able to reach him and recover the pilfered river water that appears to be beer. I then park the car in front of him, and thankfully, he's stopped. So what's next? The thieving guy walks off down the alley just as my exhausted head believes I've managed the problem. How could I have missed that possibility? At this point, though, I've gone too far and I won't let him get away with his carbonated beer impersonation. I've had to force myself to concentrate long enough to drive home because of him, and even though I've already expended more energy than I intended to, I'm not going home empty-handed. The thief is now terrified. I'm not sure why the abrupt change, but he looks really afraid. He turns to shout for people to leave him alone, and at that very moment, the front tire hits a little puncture, slightly propelling the car forward. Enough so that the thug would at least assume I'm attempting to hit him. After telling me I'm insane, he turns around and lets go of the beer. I yell back, Thank you! Wondering whether I'm crazy or if I'm simply so frustrated that I'm willing to give up and go get the stolen things. My husband is now racing down the alley as I make my way back to the car. Well, that means I won't have to get back in the driver's seat. He finally arrives at the car as I'm locking the passenger door, but he finds he can't get inside because the seats are too high. Good job, he says as he adjusts the seat, and I respond, Yeah, can we go home now? When we arrive at the store, the child has returned safely, and I carry the likely flat beer inside and place it on the counter. The child is expressing his gratitude and appreciation for us, and our former youth responds, It's them. I knew they'd get it. They consistently act. I know now that perhaps we are a little insane. Most likely, we always have been. We just cannot allow such things to occur in our town, and we're both aware that this thief would eventually escalate if he had grown accustomed to be able to do this. One of our children is pictured there. We've had conversations and gotten to know them over time at the camps. They've imparted knowledge to us. We took action because we cannot permit criminal activity to worsen to the point where it may endanger people's lives. 
These kinds of situations usually result in the police filing a report against them, or making an arrest. But since he didn't own a car and we didn't know him, we were unable to provide them with any information that would allow them to locate him. I realize it's not the best course of action, and I can't even begin to count the number of times we've been able to use these circumstances to demonstrate love and provide for one another. But this child trusted us, and needed to feel like he had some control over the situation. Allowing someone to become so at ease that they believe that they have the right to take what they want, and will eventually be willing to harm these children in order to have it, is not worth it. Now I know why the guy was so terrified when he saw the jeep on the way home. It seems that my spouse was familiar enough with me to anticipate that I would check in once I was unable to see or hear them. He had warned the man that if he didn't merely give him the beer, a jeep would come after him. The man believed that to indicate that he would dash back to retrieve his car. He laughed at him, thinking he would have been gone by then. But when I leave the back parking lot two seconds later, the sound is clearly audible, particularly on a calm, dark roadway. In turn, Hubby responds, Told you so, to him. That explains the thief guy's extreme fear. He thought for a mere two seconds that they would cease their foot pursuit and turn around, allowing him enough time to escape, only to have a jeep with a jacked-up engine charge straight at him. You guys, husband was aware that I would arrive. It seems that he views me as the real-life Sarah Lance. Even though I might need to jack up my Jeep to finish the task, I'll manage to finish it. Thus, most people's Tuesday nights aren't what they would consider usual. Please, don't take from any of our children or from our small town. You guys sound like a pair of modern-day heroes. I mean, literal action heroes. The fact that you've done this several times, enough even at this same particular store, that the kid there that's working there recognizes you guys and fully trusts you to handle the situation, is, well, he probably shouldn't fully trust you to solve the situation and you should probably still call the police, which I would assume that maybe he did. We did mention the police in the story, but, but it wasn't expressly stated that they called the police. So, maybe... I think we should all be very thankful that there are people like you guys who are willing to step up in the face of action and take action to stop people from doing stuff like this. Because, like you said, if criminals get away with something once, then they get the little taste of evil and getting away with it, it's just going to keep repeating itself. Gotta nip that stuff in the bud, and you guys did exactly that. Good stuff. The next story is... Karen thinks money solves everything. My lawyer and I don't think so. Not long ago, I got a new neighbor. In this story, I will call her Karen. By the way, the funny thing about this situation is that her real name is very similar to Karen. I think many of you will guess her real name and write it in the comments. So, I've been living on my family farm for years. For me, it's a special kind of pleasure when you can go out in the morning and breathe fresh air that hasn't had time to mix with car fumes. I've also always been happy to be surrounded by so many acres of land that were just completely ours. I worked on these fields since I was a kid, and I was formed as a successful farmer. The worst thing for me was probably the fact that there was a local HOA in this area. But to be honest, it wasn't very annoying. I was constantly involved in discussions about reducing the HOA fees, but I still realized that the HOA helped me personally more than it hurt. In general, my family and I have always had good relations with all of our neighbors. In all the years that I can remember, I only once had a conflict with a neighbor because we couldn't decide who owned a piece of the garden, but after several months of active negotiations, we finally resolved our conflict. And then many years later, we became actually relatives because our children got married. I'm a little surprised by this fact myself, but that's not the point of the story. Karen's new neighbor was famous for throwing very lavish parties for a large number of people. She owned a very large property because her private property used to be part of a giant farm that was sold off piecemeal. Karen bought the largest piece of land so she had enough space to build really whatever she wanted. 
She had several swimming pools, two garages, a place with a canopy to hold banquets in the summer, and much more. The average number of people at her parties is about 50. She's a well-known blogger, locally, who throws these parties to show everyone how rich and successful she is, and how she can afford to spend so much money just for show. By the way, it's not even her money. I mean, it's not like she earned all this money as an influencer. She's the daughter of a very wealthy local businessman who can sponsor his children's whims and not even notice that he's lost some hundred thousand dollars on an unnecessary party. I don't know why this Karen chose our neighborhood, because it's not famous for any wealth or great infrastructure. My neighbors are mostly farmers, just like my family. We're not used to loud parties or spending hundreds of thousands of dollars just to create the perfect picture to show off on social media. But the first problem was that this Karen started to constantly complain that our neighborhood did not meet her high standards. At every event that our HOA held, she tried to promote the idea that we should pay 5 to 10 times more HOA fees so that she would not feel ashamed that when her very rich and distinguished guests came to visit her and had difficulty getting to her house because their expensive cars had too little clearance for our local roads, I didn't really understand her complaints because she saw the new property she was buying. She had to come look at the land many times, and she could see the condition of the road in the neighborhood. This begs the question, why did you buy this land and build so many new buildings here if you weren't satisfied with the neighborhood? Personally, I don't have the means to increase my contributions to the HOA by 5 to 10 times. If this Karen wants our neighborhood to become a fashionable place so much, then let her allocate the funds for it. I don't think any of the neighbors will be that much against that. The next push came when Karen crossed the line. The fact that she called for an increase in HOA fees is her personal opinion, to which she is 100% entitled. But she has no right to use my private property as if it was her own. Unfortunately, she started using my land as if it were hers. One day, without my permission, when this Karen was having another party with probably 150 people, she declared that a piece of my land was now her private land and allowed her guests who came from California to park on my private land. When I noticed this, I had a giant dissonance because I knew that her piece of land was much bigger than mine. But I just didn't realize that she had hosted so many people this time. Indeed, she no longer had a place to park cars because her yard is so designed that you can't put cars in the backyard. But this is not my problem. It's her problem. If you invite so many people, you have to think about everything like that in detail. Don't have enough room for their cars? Rent a bus for them. Tell them to take the bus and leave their cars at home or something. You could think of many options. The easiest one is just don't invite so many people. To be precise, there were 76 cars on my land. I immediately called the police and called my lawyer. The police were able to get all the people to leave my private property, and Karen was arrested and a report was written. To be honest, I thought that Karen and her family would somehow slow down the process, but no. It played a cruel joke on Karen that she initially thought the police knew nothing and claimed that it was her private land. She was naive enough to think that she was the smartest person in the situation. Well, she was charged with crime, and she went to trial. Of course, her family had money for legal professionals, so her lawyer was obviously very expensive. In accordance, the trial was very long. But in the end, she was found guilty. They filed an appeal very quickly, but... It didn't really help them. Taking into account many factors, her punishment was six months in prison, and she was also ordered to pay quite a lot of money. She had to pay the money that I lost because of her for the lawsuit, and she also had to pay me moral compensation and restore my private land after 76 cars were parked on it. The next story is, 
shopping trip turned upside down. It wasn't even in my undergraduate years. It was a long time ago. I'm aware of this because, having worked in retail, I particularly enjoyed listening to David Sedaris's Sanaland Diaries and gloomed on to a sentence that was witty and well-placed. I heard it on a friend's computer. However, I was out shopping. The old neighborhood had become somewhat of a rough place. There was security installed, the beeping scanners at the grocery store department store door. There's a corral for video games and electronics, and a diamond and jewelry section that's well lit, and more mirrors to provide even more dazzle. In search of a few plastic bags, simple yet robust enough to support the bulky goods that are constantly shifting in the small, extended cab of the Japanese pickup truck. The lane, which is usually broad enough for three shopping carts to pass, is striped with totes and lids from bottom to top during certain seasons. However, this enjoyable shopping excursion will not go down well with the cruel Cruella Scandinavian woman. No, the abrupt brash of carts and the clicking of dentures break my list as I'm thinking, staring off into space and wondering if road flares fit in that or a bungee cargo net. Well, I'm parked, but whatever. I quickly recover and respond, saying, Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. I'm hoping your cart insurance is decent. My fellow customer becomes enraged when I attempt to utilize comedy to diffuse the situation I find myself in. They've been impolite in invading my personal space after attacking me with their cart. I've been waiting for you to help me, young man, if you're not too tubby to be a man. From there, give me a lid. I look over, offended, realizing that they must have thought that I worked there because of the red polar fleece vest my mom bought me from Eddie Bauer. Retail performs the best job when it comes to aprons and smocks, but this is by no means a target. I'm sorry, but I think you're mistaken. I... Being courteous was an acknowledgement of our submission to the corporate overlords we were serving. Before I could say anything further, I'm going to fire you. How do you feel about that? I was, to be honest, doing a part-time job elsewhere, so things would be tight if I lost that. My body language as I adjusted my stance and my facial expressions as I considered it probably gave away my thoughts. Yeah, she said. Just what do you think about that? I inclined myself towards her uneven, pointed finger, the metal loops encrusted with sparkling stones shimmering subtly in the brilliant, fluorescent lights illuminating the sky above. Reciting the first line from David Sedaris that immediately came to mind, yeah, well, I'm going to have you hit it. I spoke softly, quietly, and with a stiff upper lip, like a low, sharp whisper. I straightened up again and took a hesitant step back. With her eyes wide with terror, she let out a yell that eluded me, stammered three paces away, grabbed her cart, and bolted from the scene. I wondered if I really needed to buy at this store, if I had to stay put to finish my transaction. The woman reappears with two employees in tow, instead of the cart, before I can even take three steps and follow my inclination to flee. That's who he is. He's there. The worker has to be fired. The two workers stare in disbelief. Is there a man crouching in the aisle, hiding behind the somewhat larger man? The manager type realized that the man in the red vest was mistaken for an employee. The manager sternly inquires as to what is going on as the woman tears and speaks in a dialect of modified Dutch around the corner after he gives the other employee the go-ahead to do so. How dare I frighten this little old woman? I was about to leave and said that I did not feel safe shopping. He gives me an incredulous, wait, what? expression. Make a police call. I don't feel secure in her company. I don't feel comfortable because she attacked me with her cart and then made other threats. I want to file a charge. She's shouting, He's going to hit me! As she rounds the corner at this point. Fire his butt! The management recognizes that things have gotten out of hand and history has shown that whoever yells first loses. I choose to remain put and request assistance from the police in a composed and quiet manner, refusing to give up. It descended. Someone called the police. 
I stated that I felt intimidated and uneasy shopping there after she approached and bumped me. I was perusing and going about my business when she crashed into me with her cart, according to the videotape. Her combative posture, her witchcraft-related curse, and my surprise at telling her, I can't help you, made her appear utterly insane. What about the threats? The loss prevention guy inquired. That's what made me feel so unsafe, I retorted. I'm not sure how to react to such absurdity from an elderly woman. Although it was advised that I complete my shopping, I simply continued to browse before heading out without making any purchases. She was fiercely struggling as they were putting the woman in handcuffs and loaded her into the police car as I was getting out. Astonished to see me, the manager expressed regret for the situation and invited me to return for my shopping. We appreciate your good nature. The woman will not shop there. If she ever returns to their premises, if she ever returns to their premises, she will face criminal trespassing charges. Yeah, this old lady was just a party pooper. I liked your attempt at humor to defuse the situation. I mean, assuming that her hitting you with the cart or someone hitting you with the cart was an accident, of course. Uh, which it very much does not seem like it was in this lady's case. I think the way that you handled the situation here is impressive. I don't think you could have done much better. I think that was the appropriate response to call the police. Everything got sorted out and hopefully that old lady gets put in her place a little bit so she can stop and think twice before she does that to someone else, somewhere else, of course, now that she's banned from this particular store. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe, like, and comment.